Welcome. I'm your host, Julie Poole, a Law of Attraction coach, hypnotherapist and spiritual teacher. This show is for anyone interested in living their best life on all levels, mind, body and soul. My aim is to uplift, inform and inspire you. So let's chat and move you from hoping to having. Hello everyone and welcome to today's show and I am blessed to have the wonderful Penny Thornton on today and Penny's going to be talking to us about astrology. So Penny is a huge, very, very big astrologer to the stars, to Princess Diana no less. Now, straight away, I'm in awe. Penny clearly knows what she's doing. Tell us, Penny, about you. Welcome, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on your show. You're very welcome. So you were saying on your website that you've been classically trained in astrology since 1977. You know your stuff. So it is a very long time. Of course, I tend not to talk about those years, you know, being vain. Um, <laughs> but yes, it is a long time. And um, I had a very interesting kind of intro into astrology because um, when I was younger, there wasn't a lot of astrology around. There were the sun sign columns in newspapers. But I remember I was really, really fascinated about astrology and I really wanted to know as much as I could about it. And here I was at the Royal Ballet School with a whole lot of, you know, little dancers. And yet I was always curious about the astrology. So um, I think I was a student just before I got to the company. One of my fellow fat mates had had her chart done by Ingrid Lind, who was a very, very famous astrologer at the time. And they were all written in those times, you know, everything's written. And I read her report and I thought, oh, this is just wonderful. You know, would she see me? So um, she did. I had my little report. And at the end of it, Ingrid had said, um, I love Aries. Um, my daughter Tinks is an Aries. So anytime you're passing, pop it. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going. And I think I caught the bus, like, you know, that, that weekend. And that was really the beginning of everything because Ingrid was the president of the Faculty of Astrological Studies. So as much as I had a kind of um, first-hand kind of introduction to astrology, um, she was also part of a, the White Eagle Lodge, which is a very spiritual organization. They work on the inner planes. And so I had all of this. It was like a welcome home at that age. Um, but then it took me another few years before I finally got to a place where I thought I would go and learn. And um, it was when I was married, first married, and I was working, doing stuff. And my then husband said, um, I really don't want you working anymore. Just, I want you to be at home. It was those days. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll go mad. I must do something. He said, well, take up a hobby. So that's when it began. I thought, right. And so I signed up to the Faculty of Astrological Studies and zipped through their program, getting my diploma in 1977. So that's the background. <laughs> wow. Wow. And I see that. You've taught and lectured in the UK, Europe, Australia, North America. You've been on television. Good Morning Britain, which for those of you outside the UK is kind of the number one breakfast TV show. Um, and that you've been an astrologer to Princess Diana and probably a lot of other famous people, which you probably can't discuss. But how did you get into being Princess Diana's astrologer? Well, um, in 1982, I wrote my first book. Um, it was part of a series. Um, Dawson's Aquarian Press, and um, this is Harper Collins as it is now, and um, it was about relationships because my special my speciality in astrology really is relationships. So I wrote this book, and I thought, you know, Charles and Diana just getting married, and I thought, well, I will use these two as my complete expose on how you break down a relationship in astrology. What what are you looking for? And so as I did this, they were just married. And I was thinking, oh, how extraordinary. I don't think this is going to work. It's going to work at all. But you have a responsibility as an astrologer 
just think you read a book about yourself and somebody says, oh, well, she's going to die of heart failure at age 33. I mean, that's not a nice thing to read, nor is it good to know that the marriage that you've just um, entered into isn't going to last. So I had to be very careful with my kind of the way I put things. But um, yes, I did even mention the word divorce in the middle of a sentence. And so that was 1982-83. And um, then in 1986, I had, I, I don't really think we want to get into this story. It's, 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 it's a long story. Okay. But um, in fact, Diana had received a copy of my book. She'd been sent this book by someone else. But the way she came to pick up the phone to me that morning in 1986 was by another route entirely. This was uh, wow, another part of her family. So um, that's how it all began. Wow. Wow. And you've written lots of books, haven't you? You mentioned that book in HarperCollins, a major publisher. Um, and you've written, was it eight books? Nine, actually, all wow. together. Um, so my most recent one, which is Introduction, to interpretation really is came out of my teaching because I have students of astrology and I realized they were getting terribly stuck because they had all this knowledge. They knew what the planets meant, the signs, the angles, you know, all of it. But when it came to actually being able to talk about it in a coherent way, to actually put it, put it all together, they struggled. They didn't know where to begin. They didn't know what to choose, what not to choose, how to say something. And so, you know, the astrology handbook, interpretation, part one, is how it came to be written. And I put it into basically nine simple steps. You know, they're nine headings, if you like, and then showed how you structure, you know, what, what, what you do, how you say it, how to put things across, what your reference is, and to also kind of stagger your interpretation, build it so that you start on a kind of simple level, talking about generalities, which are really, really nice. But as you go deeper and deeper, you get into the more complex aspects of a chart. So you've already got the trust of your client, so to speak. And now you're open to looking at the more complex bits that challenge us in life. Um, and, and so that's, as I said, the reason I wrote it and you know, that's, why is that out there? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So where can people find your books? I know that they're on your website. Are they on Amazon as well? And Well, really, Amazon.com is, is better or Amazon.co.dot or if you're in Australia, dot, uh, co dot au. Yes. You know, so it's, it's on all of them. I mean, you know, I can send them out, but, you know, if you try to send a book to America, as you will know, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Yes, it's yeah, my books are Amazon. on Amazon and it's go to your local Amazon, whatever yeah. country you live in, you'll find them there. So yeah. fascinating. I mean, I love astrology. I did a little brief 10-week introduction to astrology back in 2000, I think it was. Um, and I just realized you're not even scratching the surface. This is deep. And the teacher that we had, she said, I, I've been learning this for 15 years and I'm still learning. It's layer upon layer upon layer. Um, so I know at the moment we've got some massive shifts. I mean, everybody's talking about Pluto and Saturn changing signs and the transits and the eclipses. How is that affecting us? What's actually going on astrologically for us across the globe right now then, Benny? Yeah. And I suppose this is a pretty big question. Um, and I think I, want to, I sort of, I want to say, first of all, occasionally I will use the word energy. I'd rather use the word dynamic because I think we have to remove ourselves from the ideas of planets as energy. Now, having said that, like any living thing, and when you think about the solar system and all the planets, all of us, Earth, Venus, Mercury, Saturn, and so we're a part of our family. We're a solar system family. We were formed out of the same bang, if you like. So in a way, we all have a consciousness. When we think about Earth and the old Gaia principle, which is beginning to make a bit of a comeback, the idea that the Earth is a living being, yet the idea there is a consciousness. And in that way, I think there is a connection between all the planets 
and ourselves. But I think when it comes to talking about astrologies, and, and we all slip into this a bit, you know, Pluto makes us. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make us do anything. When we look at the planets in their cycles and in their signs as they move around the sun and they form angles with the other planets, they have relationships with other planets, relationships with us, and this is a constant dynamic. It is the music of the spheres, they're constantly moving and interchanging. These patterns we're involved with, the patterns we can see because we know where the planets are. We look at an ephemeris and we know Pluto is in Aquarius, Mercury is in Pisces. So we have a reference. We, we know what's going on. But it's almost as though we're part of that so that the planets in their cycles and as they form their angles, they're a narrative. And it is the narrative of our lives as well. Humanity has a narrative. Does it do the angles cause that narrative to happen? More like synchronicity as we go along and the planets move along in their cycles, we're all part of a developing narrative. And I think if we can look at it like, like that, we're probably on firmer soil than we are with the idea of heavenly vibrations. That to me is a bit of a misnomer and it takes us into the wrong place. And I think looked at as a whole, the solar system as a whole, part of the planetary tribe, planetary family, all of us developing, evolving, moving forward, part of this celestial harmony, if you want. I think that's magical and wonderful. So having said that, um, the idea of the age of Aquarius has been around for a long time. These ideas of great ages, every 2000 years or so. The uh, it, we shift into a different age. So we've been in the age of Pisces since the birth of Christ, two thousand years. So it has been expected that we would move into Aquarius. There's no date. It doesn't go into a you know we don't enter the age of Aquarius on the fourth of February two thousand and twenty three, although we might. But the idea is that. Um, very interesting. As the, as one age ends and a new age begins, you are getting a kind of um, cross pollination almost. It's like two great oceans coming together: the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. So they, they are, or well, the Indian Ocean, they're coming together, and it's very treacherous. It's you know the the, the you know trying to move your ship long where these two great oceans are meeting. Is dangerous. And that's really sort of where we are at the moment. And if you go back, look over 2000 years to the time before Christ was born, you can see how incredibly stormy that was. And we're in that same position now. So if you look back, back into the 60s and you heard that musical hair, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So it has been in the consciousness for a while. And there have been a lot of alignments that astrologers have thought, hey, guess what? This is the entry into the age of Aquarius. So in a way, all of them are sort of right because we're in this cross-pollination of seas. We're in this stormy period where one is giving way to the next and a lot of things are changing beyond comprehension. But really and truly, I think the minute Saturn went into Aquarius, Jupiter went into Aquarius. So we're talking about 2020, 2021, and now 2022, Pluto in Aquarius. This really is the doorway into this new age. And you know, the principles of Aquarius are manifold and, and, and complex because although we tend to think of Aquarius as this enlightened sign, you know, we think of uh, the water bearer, and people do think it's a water sign, but it's not. That urn. Is uh, and the and what we see coming out of the water bearer's urn is ether. It's all about spirit and knowledge, and because Aquarius is an air sign. So, as but it's also a fixed sign, and fixed signs are really about fixing things. You know, getting things into a form, getting them into a coherent form. So we think about Aquarius and what this age might bring. 
enlightenment, artificial intelligence, all these things we can see happening, they're within range. I mean, suddenly there's been this surge of, you know, in intelligent chat, which is alarming. So we are growing fantastically quickly into all the technological space age side of Aquarius. But we have to remember it's a very uh, rigid sign. And so the same sign is, is giving us an understanding that in order, if you like, for humanity to survive, there have to be many more restrictions on us because we don't have the supplies that we used to have. So this is why you're getting a big sort of swing towards far right governments and leaders who are in charge. So we face a bit of a troubled entry into this age. So I don't want to keep going on. I could go on for two hours, but I don't just bore everybody. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely not boring. I know from a spiritual perspective and the new consciousness, um, we've known this is coming for a long time. I've been in this um, this world for actively uh, about 40 years and um you know they were talking about 2012 and then 2021 and 2023 and 2032 and we're actually now in that and you know when i was um teaching full time and doing this back in the 90s and early noughties it was seems such a long you know we're moving towards it another 20 30 years and here we are now in it um and it's i look back and think gosh it seemed to have gone very very quickly but I know that, you know, Saturn is a big hitter. He's also just changed signs. Pluto's just changed signs. And, you know, this opening up and what we are hearing from my higher level guides and consciousness is that it's all needing to crack open like an egg. And some of it is not going to be comfortable. But what it is birthing is a new freedom. And for the new freedoms to come through, there is going to be a lot of resistance from the powers that be that want to hold on to the powers. And is that the way that you sort of see it playing out with Pluto and Saturn and these changes, that it's this dynamic between that, the freedom and the power that's, that's colliding? Well, I know a lot of people are talking about the cry of the people, so to speak, to get to the freedom that but the human spirit requires. Um, so yes, yeah, Saturn has just moved into Pisces and then a couple of weeks later, Pluto into Aquarius. So I think people have put these two things together in these astrological labels and thought, you know, this is perhaps more significant than it is. I think the really significant thing is Pluto in Aquarius. Okay. You know, the idea that Saturn went in, Jupiter went in, and now Pluto, we're now fully embracing Aquarius and all it has to offer is a, it's a very big thing. Saturn only spends a couple of years in a sign. So it's going to move on to Aries in 2025, 2026. So it's a short term kind of thing. It does close a cycle, these two years between 2021 and 2025, almost 2026. There will be a lot of dissolving going on because Pisces is the last sign of the zodiac. Aries being the first week kickoff on a new thing. All of that I, I can get. My view on it is, is really sort of rather more about humanity has evolved. I mean, we go back to Neanderthal method. We're back. Humanity has evolved over millions and millions of years. And we are now beginning to make a huge or take a huge evolutionary step. So this is to do with our consciousness. And we are, and although we may think that it is counterintuitive to say all these devices that we've got, this artificial intelligence that is doing things for us. So maybe humanity is in decline in a way. We're taking a back seat now and letting technology do it for us. I think it's an important evolutionary step because what will happen is we will start to think and act in a very different way because we have to, we have to evolve in this way. So I do see consciousness being an important part of this transition that we're I mean making. we call it the birthing into the 5D the fifth dimension the higher level consciousness the more awareness of others and of self it's an, a self actualization becoming much more integral about who am i where am i going why do i want to go there what's it all about the existentialism it's really we're figuring ourselves out we're coming out of a sleep we're coming out of a just you know, that, that on the hamster wheel, another day, another dollar, do it again, do it again, do it again. 
we're rising out of that saying, hang on, why am I doing this? Does this actually fit me? Does this, is this in my highest good? What else could I be doing? The choices, the freedoms are starting to come through. I want to pick up one of the points you made because I've already learned loads from you because I just know a little bit about astrology (laughs) and I know about the fixed signs and the mutable signs and the cardinal signs, but I don't really know the difference. I mean, mutable means what? You just more go with the flow? How how would you describe it? It's dispersive. It's dispersive. Um, Equivocal. Um, You know, there's all sorts of possibilities, you know, it's like, why are we trapping ourselves into little narrow channels of thought or behavior or anything? In fact, let's be open to everything. Let's be open-ended about things. So the mutables, you've got a lot of mutability, then you're very open-ended, very equivocal. If you're cardinal, which starts everything off, if you look at the cardinal signs that begin each sequence, the cardinal houses begin each sequence of houses. And they're the initiators. They're the ones that come out and say, this is what we're doing. Let's go with it. Let's make it happen. Let's build it. Right. Now your six signs, which are the next ones in between the mutables who are dispersive, the cardinals who are active and initiating, got fixed signs who are saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's consolidate. Let, let's, we've got this start. Let's find out where we are. Let's take a few things from here and sit with it for a while before we go elsewhere. And when I look at my house systems, and this is the next book I'm writing, which is all about the houses, I look at the houses that are fixed in the horoscope, um, which are also called succeeding for anybody who's interested. I call them the houses, the survival house. This is what we need to survive. So the second house, the eighth house, the uh, 11th house and the fifth house are about survival. And when you think about the eighth house, this is all about intimacy, sex, exchange, receivership. You know, we need that in order to survive. (laughs) And we think about the fifth house, which is about love and the heart, procreativity, creativity. We secure the survival of the species. (laughs) And the 11th house is able to say slightly different level. So I suppose you could say, looking at the age of the at the age of Aquarius, which is both an air sign, which is to do with the realm of thought and travel and speed and high tech, um, it's also about survival, which is an okay. interesting thing. Well, good. Okay, thank you for explaining that. But another question that I have that I'm often asked by the people that watch me is, you can't get your rising sign, your ascendant, unless you have your time of birth. And your rising sign is apparently more important than your sun sign. Um, I don't have my time of birth because in the UK, we didn't, the, the doctors, the nurses did not put the time of birth down, just the date. So it's down to your parents remembering what time you were born. My parents are in their 80s. One of them has dementia. The other one's memory isn't so great either. Um, and the best I get out of them was sometime after lunch. <laughs> you know, so well, like that's a good start. It's, it's a, a good start. start. So it's that's somewhere it's... between sort of yeah. one and three o'clock. And I feel into it and I think, well, that's going to put me as a rising, either Scorpio or Sagittarius. So I read into the rising uh, Scorpio and that feels very much like me, 100%. Yeah, I and I read Scorpio is probably more like you than Sag. Yeah, and when I read Sag, and it feels a little bit like me, but not quite. So I think Mm. I'm just going to put me down as a Scorpio rising. But many people say to me, What do I? I was adopted. I've got no clue. Or my parents died young. I've got no clue. How can, how can people try and get more information about their chart without their date, their time of birth? Well, really and truly, you do need someone who has some memory about it, some member of the family who remembers being phoned by, your father phoned me and I was just about to step into the bath. You know, you need sort of family tales about your birth. Um, and in fact, we should talk about Princess Diana in a minute. Okay. But, um, which is very, re- very interesting. There is something called rectification in astrology, which is where an astrologer will take details of all the most important events in your life, but, well, birth marriage, you know, those kind of things. You had a major accident, you got promoted, you did a first stage show. So taking all those details and then kind of fiddling around a bit with what seems to fit all of that. And I know a lot of astrologers 
hold great great store by that. I, I, I don't. I think it's a bit iffy because sometimes you will think you've got the right ascendant and you think, right, that really, really fits. All these things bounce off. Then somebody finds, I mean, one of my clients actually found their poroscope. <laughs> actually found it. So that then you have a different kind of proof and it's not the same. So it is difficult. You're, I'm work with what's called a sunrise chart. I will use the sun as the first house. And then at least you're sure about that sun sign. And your sun sign is such a central part of your being. I describe this as like your nationality. You know, if you're Welsh, if you're English, if you're Italian, if you're Australian, then you'll share some of your country's national characteristics. And yeah. we all do. We and say, I had um, an astrology reading with Ty Hudnell just before Christmas, and he said to me, you're a Virgo, but not as we know it. You are <laughs> absolutely not a typical Virgo because I've got nine planets in Virgo. I mean, it's just ridiculous what's in Virgo. But he was spot on with what he was saying to me. Um, and I find that when you actually have a proper astrologer do your chart, it is incredibly accurate, just ridiculously accurate. Um, to the point where um, the reading I had with Emily, another astrologer, she she did a soul astrology reading on me and um, she literally nailed it down to the month and the year where significant things had happened and they were so accurate. I, right. It's incredible the way that astrology, when it's done by experts such as yourself and you know, you're one of the leading experts in the world, um, when somebody has a proper birth chart reading with you, you, you just the detail is phenomenal. Yes, it is. And I think the interesting thing about that is that astrology is, is hard work to really get there. And even then you're never there because you're always going to learn something else. But I think part of it is that using your technique and knowing all the techniques, that's the kind of hard wiring you have. And so you don't have to think about it because you're hardwired. We've been doing it for decades, like I have. That's all hardwired. But the dynamic between you and a client then takes you, you need to be in the zone. And so it will seem as though you're making very logical statements based on what you can see in a horoscope. But in point of fact, there is that extra dimension that you are now in. And for many, many years when I was working with clients, I always felt, well, I want to take my clients through their charts. This is the only chance they've got. I want to talk about their ascendant. I want to talk about their moon sign. I want to get them to know their astrological makeup. And I, I did it relentlessly for years. But I sort of feel I don't have time to do that, which sounds terrible. And I just open up and I go for it. I go straight for where I want to go in that chart. And that's always the point at which it's like, oh, my goodness, that's it. That's, you're trusting that's, your inner guidance right. to say that's yeah, the bit I, they yeah, need to know. I, I think that has changed. And several years ago, I did um, a seminar for the Kepler um, College of Astrology. And I called it um, uh, the astrology of um, what, what, it was, what it came down to was being able to look at a chart and get its main theme out of it. You know, what it's the art of distillation. So we are keeping it very simple. You're looking at, hey, what is this telling me, this chart? What is the key focus for this chart? What is the key focus for this session? And that is so important because from that, the minute you get to the heart of your client, the, the, that point where you've just opened up so much, it's like everything else opens up then. So it's, it's a remarkable tool, but it is scientific. And that's another thing I wanted to mention. There's a wonderful book. Uh, um, what is it? A Scheme of the Heavens. Came out a couple of years ago. An American um, psychologist, astrologer. Brilliant book. And in there, he talks about some of the astrologers working in the Second World War. And they were pinpointing where, you know, bombs were going to be, where to target their secret service. I mean, 
that was kind of scary because I, I was thinking, you know, if I was, if we were now in World War II and I was part of a team that was having to chart and, and have that responsibility this is where attacks would come or where to strike is fantastic. And this is all documented. That's so amazing. there is a real science of astrology as well as the tool that most of us use it for, which is about, you know, really helping people with their lives, uh, helping them to live better, to be better, to achieve what they're looking for in life and to come to terms with the things they can't change. I think oh, that's I what... totally, totally agree. I think for, for me, with my little 10 week course that I did, the biggest take that I got out of that was self-acceptance. And um, I remember her looking at my chart and saying, oh, double Mercury, your moon is in um, Gemini and you've got a huge amount, all your feelings are in Gemini and you means you have to talk about your feelings and you analyze everything to death. You'd make an amazing counsellor. I said, that's actually what I'm doing. I've just qualified as a hypnotherapist and counsellor. Um, and she was perfect. And she said, there's, there's a huge amount of spirituality in there as well. And you keep railing around it and trying to go into business, but it will keep pulling you back because it's who you are meant to be. Um, and the biggest take for me on that was this over analytical side of me. At that stage, I was about 38 and I'd had it all my life, this criticism about, I, Judy, you're so analytical. Just does it matter? Just let it go. Just and I said, I can't, I can't, I have to talk about this. I have to understand it. I have to pull it apart. I can't not. And she said to me, this astrologer, just accept this is who you are and work to change the things that you can change. But that part of you, that analytical part of you, if you were a, if you were a tree and we cut you open, that analytical part would go right the way through your core. You can't change it. So just accept it. And that mm. moment, I literally just accepted it. And from there on, if somebody told me to stop analyzing, I said, sorry, it's who I am. And I continue to work on things that I could perhaps have a chance of improving because that that's just who I am. So I found it an amazing um, help with my own understanding of self. Um, and it's just it's just beautiful. And we often as well can beat ourselves up for certain things. You know, I've had some great hardships in my life, as many people have, and periods of great struggle. And sometimes we can look back and think, you know, that that was a really bad decision, or I wish I'd have done something different. And then so that I, I didn't have to have had that experience. And then I'm, I'm having a, an astrology chart and they're saying, oh, yeah, 1987 to 1994, they pinpointed it exactly. It was in the stars. It was in my charts. And it's like, oh, so it wasn't something I did wrong then. It was something that was actually fated or destined or meant to be within my path. That, that, that It was in there. Um, and it was absolutely spot on accurate, um, which, again, I find extraordinary. So you were saying about Princess Diana and her birth chart and said you wanted yes. to tell, come back to that. So tell me more about that. This then. is just so interesting. Um, I'm not a Virgo, but I'm very analytical. I have a lot of sixth house planets. So, I, you know, that's my Friday Bites, which I do every Friday, which are looking at events in the world through an astrological lens. The research that goes into that to make sure I've got the stories right, <laughs> that's something that's innate. and. Uh, you know, really fascinates me. So um, when uh, Princess Diana, or well, as she was at the beginning, Lady Diana came on to, um, into our lives um, and she was dating Prince Charles and then, you know, but obviously it was going to morph into an engagement. We at the Astrological Association really needed to know, you know, what time was she born so that, you know, so that um, Charles Harvey, who was then the, um, president of the Astrological Association had been in touch with the Palace Press Office to request Lady Diana's time of birth. So oh, wow. they came back and they said, oh, and gave the date 2 p.m. in the afternoon is what they said. So of course, we all rushed away and it was 2 p.m. in the afternoon. But anyway, uh, about maybe a day or two later, uh, the Palace Press Office informed Charles Harvey that that was wrong and that she was born at 7.45 in the evening. So from that point on, 7.45 in the evening it was. And even when I wrote Sinistry, which is the astrology of relationships, and looked at Diana's chart, 
in connection with Charles, I was using that 7.45 p.m. in the evening chart. So go forward, 1986, 1987, uh, one of our sessions, and I always brought the charts with me so we could have a look at them. She liked looking at the charts on the table. And she was looking at her chart and she said, what, what's this, 7.45? And I said, oh, well, that's the time you were born. And she said, no, I wasn't. I was born at two in the afternoon. I was born just before Wimbledon. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. So, of course, our sessions were very pride required. So the years after that, everyone else would still be talking about a 7.45 time of birth, but I now had this 2 p.m. time. Anyway, fast forward, I don't know, when Debbie Frank, who you may have heard of, is also an astrologer who worked with Diana. She was working from the 7.45 time. And she was absolutely adamant this was the time that Diana said she was born. She was born at 7.45 in the evening. So there was now this great confusion about which time was accurate. So aside from the fact that a 2 p.m.-ish time yields Libra rising, which to me just screams Diana, all that sort of beauty and artistry and dance and all of it, Neptune in the first house, very Diana, rather than Sagittarius rising, which is quite sort of sporty and frank and getting things wrong and, uh, you know, being very outgoing. And well, she was out, she was all those things, but there's something rather fiery about Sagittarius that with Diana, she's had this air, this more airy quality about her, more Venusian-like. So, so this went on for some years. And I suppose about uh, five or six years ago, I thought, I'm just going to have to research this myself and get it. So first of all, I had to make sure that Wimbledon was actually, they were playing. It was a Sunday. And I had got all the information for that. So I knew that was correct. There was a game. And she says I was born before Wimbledon. And then there was an article about uh, her mother was interviewed. 2003, I think it was. And in her words, she said, Diana came into the world on a beautiful, sunny afternoon. The local policemen, they were playing cricket outside, outside on the, in, on the lawn. And the local policeman scored his century the moment she arrived in the world. So for me, that was absolute proof that she was born in the afternoon and these two statements made sense. But you know something? There's such a division about this. It's a hotly contested issue. <laughs> so you will find people who will use this 2 p.m., time, 2.10, something like that, and feel utterly confident with it, and a whole group of others who will use 7.45, because that's the chart they think is correct. How interesting. That is so good to know. Gosh. Wow. I mean, obviously, both of us are British, because I know many of my watchers and listeners are all over the world, and we love to die, and I know most of the world did. So it's, it's, I find it really interesting to talk about this. Um, and there's so much information on your website, astralutely.com. You set that up in, 20, um, in 2000. That's more or less when I set my website up, first of all, as well. You know, and websites were only really just beginning then. It was all very new at the beginning of that. And I also noticed on your website that you're, um, as well as your books, your author, you also do so you're a columnist, aren't you? So you, you write an well, astrology always, column? Yeah, all over the world. That's sort of stop now. There's been a big change because newspapers, magazines, they're not, they're all online now. So there's not quite, it's not quite the same world. Um, but um, yes, I mean, there, there is a lot of work as a kind of professional astrologer that, uh, it, you know, you, you get involved with. Yes. So I mean, well, what do you, what do you offer now? What are the services you offer? So you, you don't work with clients one-to-one -one anymore. It's all oh, you I do. do. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But what I don't do I'm not accepting new clients because I c can't deal with the old ones, so to speak. <laughs> you know, I get booked up. I mean, you know, I, I can't work every single day because there are all my writing commitments that have to be done. There's all the other things that, you know, amount to an astrologer's work. Um, 
And so I've sort of said no more new clients, but some people do get through that barrier. <laughs> What's saying? I, I don't open the door, but yes, but you know, and you if do you a lot of teaching as well, don't you? With seminars and things like that. But I think if you don't work with clients, you're not going to learn anything because every client that, that comes before you is going to teach you something that yeah. you didn't know before. I completely agree. I have learned so much from and through my clients, you know, particularly when I'm, you know, when I'm working on a more psychic, intuitive capacity, the information that's coming through from the higher selves, from the angelic realms, from the, the higher level guides. I mean, I did not know that. Uh, you know, when I'm when I'm saying things that I didn't know, then I, I want to go and check and I want to try and find out. And um, I learn a lot. And, you know, I used to do, I'm a past life regressionist as well. I don't do past life regression sessions anymore. They kind of come in naturally if they're meant to come in. But um, when I used to do a lot of that, I learned so much about why we have so many past lives and wh why we have repeated things going on so much. I, I'll be talking about that in another episode, so I don't want to digress. But um, what else did I want to ask you? I'm just looking at my little list here. So you're late. I just wanted to come in there a little bit because I'm also a trained hypnotherapist. Oh, and psychotherapist. I did not know that. Yeah. And the reason I qualified as a hypnotherapist, as a psychotherapist, was that I decided to write a book about reincarnation and astrology. And during the course of writing that book, I worked with 22 uh, uh, people on a study, which was run by a psychiatrist from Guy's Hospital. Um, we worked out a way of regressing each of those, can well, not candidate subjects on that, so that they could go back in time, but also then say, where were you born? So we had charts for all those past lives. Well, during the course of that book, I, would, I never was present at any of the sessions where there were past life aggressions. Um, I just had the tapes. But after I'd met everybody and the book was written, and you know, but hearing their stories about how powerful the regression and the past life visitation had been and how it transformed some of their lives, I, I was so impressed. Um, that I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to have to do hypnotherapy because, you know, this is a very, it's one thing to work with your clients and to be able to point things out in the astrology and, you know, direct traffic that way. But the idea that you could actually help your client to go into yeah. themselves and in a very gentle way yeah. have these stories that made sense in that, you know, that, uh, that state of consciousness. I thought it was wonderful. So I, sh I share that with you. I love. Uh, That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, in the wrong hands, it can be a very damaging tool. And I know certainly in my experience that I probably had half of my clients um, came to me for past life regression because they'd had it before and it had harmed them. It had damaged them. And somebody had said, go and see Julie, she'll fix you, she'll sort it out. Because what the, the past person had done, um, that the previous um, regressionists had done, was take them to a past life, show it them and bring them back. And, you know, yeah, well, I'm just going to show you the trauma. I'm going to see, show you you being blown up. I'm going to show you this or that and bring them terrible. back without yeah. actually going through, I, I would take them to the end of life and the other side in the life review about what was that life about? What was the soul wanting to learn and experience and make sure they'd gone through the whole understanding of it um, and healing of it before I brought them back. And very often, and actually more, more times than not, it would lead on to two, three, four other lifetimes that were linked into the same sort of lesson. And we would need to keep sort of dipping into another life, coming back up, dip to another life until the full understanding was achieved. Mm -hmm. And then we were good to go. And I agree with you. It was transformative. It was healing. I found it for myself personally, because I've done lots of them on myself too, um, very useful for healing and um, fears and phobias, you know, things like fear of heights, fear of fire. I had all sorts of fears like that. I just uh, I remember watching a British program called London's Burning. It was, it was uh, a 1980s well, I drama. I loved it. 
Um, and I remember getting, I was in my 20s and I got really triggered on one episode when there was um, a, a body there that was badly burnt. And I was sitting watching the television and I could smell it. I could smell the burnt flesh. I could smell everything. And I was really shaken up. Um, and I've been spiritual since I was a child. So afterwards, I just went and sat quietly and I asked my inner self and my guides. And I, at the time, worked with White Eagle. I worked with White Eagle for 20 odd years, which is really interesting that you mentioned the White Eagle Lodge. Yeah. Um, I asked him, what was this thing with fire? And he just immediately, like showing me photographs, little clips, showed me four lifetimes where I was burnt at the stake as a witch. Um, and he's like, but that was then, this is now kind of thing. And I never was bothered about fire again after that. It just suddenly clicked. It suddenly made sense about, oh, okay, it was just triggering a little part of a memory of a past life. And then, you know, you can you can let it go and move on. But we we are digressing, but let's... We are I digressing, are we? But isn't I that such of a conversation? I'm <laughs> going to, um, I'm going to do a separate podcast on that. So perhaps I'll invite you back on for us to talk oh. about past life regressions and hypnotherapy. Um, aside from today, we're talking about astrology because some of my listeners and watchers, they might not be interested in that, but they've, they've tuned in today because we're talking astrology. So <laughs> let's bring it back to astrology then. And your, your latest book, The Astrology Handbook. So tell us a little bit more about this book. When, when did you finish it? When did it get published? Well, um, I finished the first edition. Uh, I think it was November 2021. But then I put out a second edition, which has an extra chapter now, which is the actual structuring so that, you know, you really have an idea, oh, I can handle this. I've now got these blocks yeah. and I know how to build my interpretation. And I think when I was taught astrology, it was all about writing your interpretation. And when I started out as a professional astrologer, it was mainly written reports that you did for people. But then, of course, it's not practical because it takes like, it used to take a fortnight or something, yes. you know, write a report. So I had to start seeing people. And I think now everybody's got more used to the idea with, you know, you know, these virtual meetings we can have everywhere in the world. You know, I was in Australia this morning with a client, you know, here we are this afternoon, sort of Welsh neighbors. Um, so we're talking astrology and having a conversation, which is much more dynamic. But I think if you've learned to build your interpretation the old-fashioned way, yeah. you've actually got a bit of structure. You've actually written it. Because when the actual act of writing is sending messages to your brain, you're going to, that's going to stay in there. So even though it's kind of painful, if you can write your interpretations down to begin with in practice as you go along, get used to it, you will always be confident in front of a client because you will always have a map as to how to talk to that client. And as we all know, we can sometimes get clients who um, are very difficult to work with. They might feel that they're, you, you know, they're putting you to the test. Okay, you're the astrologer, <laughs> show me. And they're always difficult to work with. Um, so you have to know how to handle that kind of uh, obstruction. Yeah. and knowing how to revert to the way that you build an interpretation and where you need to go to and how is invaluable. Yes, and is. as far as I know, there isn't another book out there that will really show you how to interpret a natal chart. So. <laughs> oh, it, sounds, it sounds amazing. I'll have to get my hands on that, have a little look. So we've talked about the planets. We've talked about this shift. This is the next 2,000 years then. Um, where do you see us, um, let's sort of wrap in this up now, where do you see us in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Where do you oh. think things are going? Gosh, um, well, th that's a really big question, Julie, and I'm not oh, sure. Just, I'm... just give me the overall kind of feel for where you feel it's going. And we're in the beginnings of this now, of this age of Aquarius. We're going to well, see some breaking okay. eggs to make the cake. Okay, well, what I do think is, and I think this comes back a little bit to the idea of the separation of the sheep and the goats. That's what you're seeing going on, but it's all right. in terms of consciousness. Yeah. And then that's also a dynamic being played out in politics. Yeah. The division. We are being divided. We're being divided by our thoughts, our beliefs, our observations, our way of living, 
our way of thinking, you know, going forward. So that division is going on and it's going to get sharper and more extreme as we go through these next five to 10 years. Um, I suppose I have a feeling that we will get some good leaders of various countries coming to the fore. You know, I mean, no, not everybody loves Zelensky. I know a lot of people criticize him, and, uh, but he's been a great leader for Ukraine at the time they needed a great leader. So I think it's going to be a very interesting period where these leaders are going to come to light because they're going to be young people. They're not going to be where, you know, we do have some very old people at the, at the moment. Um, and I think the, the, the younger generation, the Z generation, the, all these generations now wanting to take, contr not control, that's the wrong word. It's very Aquarian, but let's not talk about control. But wanting to move and change how politics and social and all these, uh, the, the way things have been, they, they're desperate for change. And so you need these figures to come out at this time. They're already born. Our great leaders are already born. They're already with us. And it, they're going to be key in this transition to a sort of different world. But at the same time, we're going to go through a, a lot of great difficulty, you know, because of climate change. The things we see and know, you don't need to be an astrologer to see that this ain't going to be cleared up in a couple of years. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. And so there are going to be all sorts of difficulties over shortages of things. And the idea that the world has to come together in order to survive, that's crucial. We have to wait and see how we go because it's not necessarily written in the stars because our consciousness comes forward and each of us making a decision about how we act, how we think. How we're going to manage this period of our lives is like one part of many, many others. And so we move humanity forward. We, in a way, are part of the choices that we will be making. And it can't be, we can't go forward into this in a bubble of love, like everyone's going to take care of us. So don't worry about it, everybody. We're all taken care of. Everything makes sense. Everybody's going to ride us through this. I think that that would be a mistake. Because I think what we have to do is get real and we have to really think, okay, how can I help this situation in my life where I've got these problems, these issues, and I'm looking out onto the bigger world, seeing where it's going. What can I personally do that's going to contribute to that help? And by doing that, if everybody did that, it's going to be fantastic. I agree. I think that, you know, my personal opinions are uh, very much about the rising consciousness is of us as individuals and of the planets. They have a consciousness too. Their consciousness is rising. I think the divisions have always been there, but what we have now is the light being shone on them and the dissatisfaction with those divisions. Whereas before, people felt very disempowered and kind of went, eh, it is the way it is, nothing I can do about it. We're rising into this time of what can I do about it? If I can't change the world, I can change my own internal world. And by changing uh, what I do, taking responsibility for me, stepping into my own mastery of my life and my world, I am influencing the collective consciousness and the rising that way. And that's where we're going to go. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you, Penny. Where can people find you? How can they uh, reach out to you? You're on YouTube, aren't you, as Penny Thornton? Uh, yes, absolutely. And my website, Astralutely, and on all sort of social media. All you have to do is write Penny Thornton and it will stream. I hope you yeah. will pop. I will put yeah. all of Penny's links into the show notes, into the description box below. So please do check them out if you want to. Link in with Penny. Come find her on YouTube as well. She's got some amazing in, um, videos there on all sorts of things going on astrologically. And Penny, it's been an absolute delight. And would you be willing to come back again and talk to us about past life regression and hypnotherapy? And we can have a good chat about that. Absolutely. Um, I think I say on my videos sometimes, um, you know, we, we need to help the spread of good astrology. You know, so the more you share, the more you t talk to people who 
have a real grasp of what's going on and what's valid and what isn't. It just helps overall to sort of grow, grow the consciousness, if you like. We're so all growing the consciousness. I love talking to you too, Julie. It's been a Real thank delight. you for being on. Thank you for being here. Have an amazing day. And thank you guys for listening to today's show. I hope that you found it helpful and useful. And I will see you next time. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed this podcast and found it useful, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google Play and more where you can leave up to a five-star review. If you want to support my work or want to know more, please go to my website, juliepoolonline.com, where you will find details of my new book, From Hoping to Having, available on Amazon Worldwide, and more about my work, products, and services. The link is in the show notes. Thank you for listening. See you in the next episode.